we'll just turn it on. And this is April the 13th, 2011, with Orrin Lee Peters. And your official birthday to turn 90 is the 23rd, is that right? Or what? No, the 16th. The 16th, okay, the day after tax day. Right. So, 90 the, years. Uh, 16th of April, 1921. Wow. So what is your early? What's your earliest memory? What what can you remember from your from your childhood that you would say is uh, going back? I mean, you remember before school, or did you remember early days in school? Well, yes, I remember about uh, when I was a kid. Uh, I lived uh, on Second Street. That's where I was born. Of course, back when I was a kid. What such thing? Hospitals. <clears throat> and, uh, oh, did, was a midwife uh, the one that helped your mom, or did the doctor come to the house? Doctor came to the house. Doctors made you uh, send for the doctor, and uh, he'd come with his little black bag. And make the house and, call. And it was a house call. That's right. Now, how many did you have, brothers and sisters? Yes, I have uh, three sisters and uh, three brothers. And where were you in the birth order? Right in the middle. Right in the middle? Yeah. Now, I had uh, three, three brothers older and one sister and one brother and uh, three sisters younger. Okay. Now, your parents came to Oklahoma at what My, time? My uh, my mother came uh, in 1889. My great grandfather and my grandfather and his brother and his sister all made the run of 1889. They did. And uh, of course, my mother and her three brothers uh, came with my uh, uh, grandfather. I mean, grandmother. Where did they because, come from? What part of the country were they? Uh, they came from Kansas, and uh, so uh, they, uh, my uh, my grandfather and his uh, his dad, brother and sister, uh, were just northeast, and. Uh, Claim their land uh, with the 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 old man at his hundred and sixty across the road from him was Will, and down on the other corner was my grandfather John. Hmm. All and adjacent then, together in the same. All, and then up in the opposite corner was. Uh, uh, my mother's aunt, Mary, and uh, she married her uh, her boyfriend right next door to her, and so she had to give up her land. It was they couldn't both they couldn't both claim no, not land. if they got married. So huh. they got married, and she gave up hers. Okay. Now, had all of them been farmers before? Uh, no. My uh, my grandfather was a was a carpenter. He hated farming, and uh, but that was the rule, wasn't it? That you had to farm that land. It had to be productive. Okay. Which and was defined as what? How productive for crops, or could you raise cattle and call it productive? Whatever. You could. Uh, Raise gardens, or but you had to live there. Right. You had to occupy it, and it had to be productive. Right. And you had to build a structure. Didn't say what kind. Hmm. Uh, it could be a cave. It could be a. In this case, uh, it was a barn, hmm. and that's what most of them did because it was functional. Right. And then you could build on them eventually, but right. and you had five years to do it. Any of those structures still standing? 
uh, on uh, on the only piece that's left. Uh, there's nothing, really. So how did your family come to be city dwellers if you all had been well, out originally? Um, well, so? uh, my grandfather, <clears throat> like I say, hated farming. So he moved up and started building, uh, doing carpenter work in Edmond. And, of course, my mother, being a child, was with... Uh, him, my uh, <clears throat> mother uh, married my dad that uh, was working on the railroad. He had a span of mules, and uh, hmm. oh, uh, a teenager. Uh, his dad was working on the railroad. They were living in a in a box car on the siding. Up at Seward. Wow. And this was uh, 1902 that uh, he came came through, and they were uh, working working the railroad, uh, <clears throat> pulling dirt. Uh, my dad had a span of mules uh, and worked a slip. No, when you say a span of mules and a slip, I'm. I don't know what those are. I bet a bunch of people listening may not know. So a span, would that be two mules? That's two mules. Okay. You have a mule or you have a span. And a slip is a like a trailer, like a, a, a wagon? Oh, no. No, it's a... Uh, yeah, I tell people it's an oversized uh, teaspoon <laughs> that <coughs> had... Uh, there was two different types one of them had a single single bar, uh, but most of them it was a uh, was about that wide and about that that deep, and had two handles on it. Uh, if you were to take an old fashioned wheelbar and take the front of it out, you would have a slip and mules that you lift it up and it fill with dirt you push it down hmm. go to where you want to dump it and flip it up in the air and come back around and do the same thing hmm. and so so you, when you needed dirt moved to a location you would hire people that had a slip and they would move the dirt right where you needed it and it was uh Horses and mules, and uh, that was. And uh, <clears throat> if you look down the railroad track, and uh, you'll see that all of that, it's it's higher. All of that dirt was right. pulled in there. Right. So would your dad have worked on this railroad track? This yes. Is right here. Yes. And of course, then after they built the tracks, they'd come by, come back. Pull more dirt up because it did wash away and mm. you know, maintain it. Maintenance. Yeah. And uh, he married my uh, mother, and uh, of course he had to move out of the the car. Yeah, right. And they moved into a tent. And uh, where, where uh, was that? Was that here in Edmond or no? Up back in Seward. I, in Seward. Where is Seward? It's not on the interstate now, and I don't know that I've been there. Is it? What's it close to? Well, if you uh, get on the boulevard and just go straight north, okay, you'll come to a little town of Seward. Still there? Still there. Uh, probably there may still be a half a dozen buildings there in the cemetery. So was it a tent yeah. city then that they were? Oh no, they had there? no. They they just. Uh, pitched the tent fairly close to the tracks because they were working uh, was responsible for a, a section of uh, of the railroad oh. that they had to 
maintain. Now, did your dad come from Kansas also? He came from Kansas. You know what part of Kansas? Either your mom's side or your dad's side came from? Uh, Lenape, Kansas. Okay. And uh, and but that was a part. It was it was at the run. The run was what drawed for them to come. Just my mother okay. with her with her dad. It was your it was the railroad then that brought your yes. dad to the state. And probably you need to know about why Edmund is here. Right. Now, I remember the historical, they talked about Summit and that this was the highest point. The highest point on the railroad. Between what point? Uh, Canadian and the Cimarron. Oh, good. And go to First Street, stand on the railroad tracks, look four directions, and you're looking downhill. That's the high spot right there. And that's the high spot. And that's why that was First Street. And, uh, that was Middle Town. Uh, and uh, Second Street was uh, First Street is the middle of town but there was uh, more activity on Second Street because uh, that was closest to the river I mean to the uh, depot and uh so, see, this was unassigned lands, and you know the history. A little bit, but uh, for people who may, un- unassigned meant in the, the Native Americans, the Indians had not been given them, and they weren't officially owned by was, anybody, right? Right. It, uh, it was, <clears throat> it was still Indian territory. But it wasn't designated. It wasn't the, designated. It was, but after the shuffling and so on, here's this piece of property that was not uh, part of a tribe. Now, when you say it was, what what do you mean? That sometime it had been? Well, when they... uh, I don't remember the, uh, the tribe that had that particular part, but... uh, See, and... And the Indians established uh, their own nations with their own government. Right. And uh, those uh, <coughs> those nations actually still exist. I, I didn't really know this until moving to Oklahoma that they are sovereign nations, and there's like 36, right. 36 of them or something. I think. And right. uh, they're they're still there. Uh, most of uh, their Courthouses have been uh, turned into museums, and uh, uh, it's there. And uh, they—that's <coughs> why you see see all of uh, the casinos. Mm-hmm. That's right. It's tribal land. It's tribal land, and they. Uh, so your parents were here at the beginning of Edmund. And your dad came to work for the railroad and... And married my mother. Were they... When did they move from Seward? And, and come uh, here? They moved... <coughs> moved from Seward to did Second. It, Seward, like S-E-W-A-R-D? Seward? Yes. Okay. To uh, Second Street. Uh, and uh, although... Uh, the house faced the west, which was Fritz. You would think it would have a uh, Fritz uh, number, yeah. but it was uh, 229 West 2nd Street okay. and was, uh, at the time that the house was built, uh, <clears throat> it was one of the craft homes. What is a craft home? You're in a craft home. Uh, that's that's the back door right there. That this is was a right standard there. standard model for this part of Oklahoma. Yeah, and uh, I'll show you some of them in just a second if we need to go outside. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, they came. 
uh, back to what I was telling you, this is was the unsigned lands. Right. This is what they ran for. Nobody lined up on the state line of what is now Oklahoma and charge in. That's all fiction? That's all fiction. Uh, because they came as far as the unassigned lands and then they ran for uh, the property. Do you happen to know where that was? I mean, where where did they actually... Sh- they did shoot a gun and they, they went off at the gunshot, right? Is that... That right. part's accurate. And not everybody... And not everybody... Uh, Oh, uh, a lot of people just got on the train and came through, and when they saw something, they'd jump off and go out and claim their land. If you notice, I never talk about staking because nobody staked and claim. So, because that's part of what the kids do in third grade or whatever. Third grade. And so there's some there, there's some fiction in, in what they were reenacting. Right. And the reason... <coughs> The reason the stakes are already here. See, all of uh, uh, Oklahoma was surveyed uh, into sections, and you have a uh, a section is one mile square. And that's why we've got Four. these roads that are the main. Section lines like 122nd That's right. and Hefner and Written and those. Everything, are everything is on the square. When you can, when you came to Oklahoma, you got into Oklahoma. Everything runs north and south, east and west. And when you got a claim, did you get a quarter of a section? You got a quarter of a section, 160 acres. So, uh, but the railroad was on. Already here, because you couldn't get from Kansas to Texas without getting permission to go through Indian territory, and the Indians very seldom gave it. So that meant that you were going around to get to Texas. Around Oklahoma? Around Oklahoma. Wow. You couldn't go through. So there was quite an up, upcry about, you know, So, Santa Fe uh, got permission to survey and build a railroad through from Kansas to Texas. And they told them, while you're surveying, says you've got to find water. Steam engines back then could only go about 25 miles without having to have fresh water. Oh, uh, <clears throat> you've got Guthrie close to it, a river. Oklahoma City River. That's more than 25 miles. So the surveyors were looking for water as they went through, and they found Spring Creek. Spring Creek is at Littler and uh, Fourth. Uh, and that park where the museum is, that's the head of Spring Creek. And that's how it got its name. There was a spring there. They said, uh-huh, water, it's close. This will be a watering hole. So they went back to the, where the railroad tracks was and uh, dug a well. And uh, that's quite uh, it, uh, it's a good story. The, they brought in uh, <clears throat> Steen and his wife and son uh, and Steen was in charge of seeing the well was dug, and the first thing they built was uh, a pump house, and that's where the Steens lived while 
And when you think about the size of that well, all by hand, picks, shovels, and buckets. A hundred car loads of rock to rock it up on the inside. And, and car loads mean a train car? What? A, a train car of rock? Or, how, or when you say car load? What? Train, train car loads of rock. Wow. So, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, so they had a, had a station here. And uh, they called it Station uh, 102 because it was between 101 and 102 miles from when, where the track started. And uh, so uh had to give it a name, so they gave it uh, <coughs> the name of Summit because it's the highest point on the railroad. But very few people ever called it the summit because uh, <clears throat> uh, they referred to it as Edmonds Station. And there was a freight, uh, <clears throat> the freight man here uh, that worked out of the station was named Edmund Burdick. And so everyone said, if you want something done, just go down to Edmund Station. He'll take care of it. So uh, Santa Fe thought, well, you know, we think a lot of old Edmund, too. He's he's a good good person. If everyone's going to call it that, we'll just name it that. So they officially named it Edmund. And that's how it got its name. Now, is that well over at Littler and Second or Fourth also? Or where is the where was the well itself that they dug? Uh The north side of the underpass is right through the well. Hmm. Like where the Edmund Sun is today? I mean, or what? further to be west of... You said the, the underpass where the train goes over now? Yes. Because they had to build it right by the track. So right. That they and, could and it was on the west side of the track. No, yeah, okay, on the west side. Okay. Uh, so uh, when they <clears throat> so here they had a had a station in the unassigned lands, and uh, they had uh, people here maintaining the station. Had uh, the coal van, the big coal van that was. Uh, let's see, that would have been. Uh, Around Fifth Street is where the, they would pull in to get coal, and uh, you've seen maybe seen the uh, statue that they have uh, up here of uh, Kentucky Daisy. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a good story about Kentucky Daisy, how she. Uh, Rode the cow catcher up and uh, jumped off, ran out, staked a claim, fired a pistol in the air, ran back and caught the end of the train uh, to go to Guthrie to, to file it. To file it. And uh, Kurt Munson, I don't know, do you know Kurt? Kurt Munson is the one that is responsible for it. And while he was raising money, I told him, I said, Kurt, that's a good story, and I tell it. But I said, uh, you know, <clears throat> when when the train got to Edmond, it stopped. They filled it with water, backed it up, put coal in it, and uh, while they were doing this, uh, Mrs. Steen was uh, feeding the crew. So uh, that was no big feat because 
you could go quite a ways and get back to the train with no problem. He says, don't tell anybody that. I'm having trouble getting <laughs> Because the trains all stopped here. Okay, with that in mind and with uh, the word that uh, they're going to open up, the unsigned lands, Santa Fe uh, knew that with every train stopping here, uh, they needed to lay out a town. So they had their surveyors on the le- on the tracks, which is legal. It was their land, but they couldn't get off of it. But uh, yeah, I think really they easy. gave them. I think they gave them ten minutes after the run started. Then they could survey the town. Hmm. They were in such a hurry to uh, survey the town that they didn't establish a baseline. They had one. The tracks. The tracks run at an angle. So the original town of Edmond was crooked. Runs at an angle. I said the edge was out here. Yeah. Did you notice there's a little jog there and straightens up? That's because they surveyed the town off of the tracks. Now, would they have had Indian tribes around if they had been no, off? No, or no, no, this was, uh-uh. Indians weren't here. Who, this was on the side. Was it federal property then? Was this is federal there? property. Yeah. <coughs> so, the Indian for air crossing and, and all, but they didn't leave it. That wasn't. You remember ever seeing Indians when you were young, or ever having oh, yeah. any interactions? Oh yes. What What do you remember about how was what? I mean, what did they look like? What, what tribe were they? Do you remember any was yeah. that a normal thing to see or unusual yeah, to see? Uh, they. Uh, uh, <coughs> They didn't come to town town often because uh, everything they had uh, they had were in in their areas where they had uh, established their they, nation. They were self sufficient. Well, sure. Area. And uh, had uh, <coughs> people. Going to Indian nations to uh, to buy and to get things because they were well established, and uh, so that's how Edmund is where it is is because of Spring Creek. Yeah. Now, in 1920s, automobiles had been around for a while. Did anybody? You remember anybody having horses when you were growing up and using horses to work, or was everything mechanized? Oh no! Uh-uh. Uh, my uh, <coughs> uh, uncle Dennis and uncle Otis—that's uh, mom's uh, brothers. Uh, they uh, they still live or lived out on uh, on their claims. And uh, that's all they had was horses. They they didn't have any mechanized to uh, to work their their land, their crops. What? How? How was their land productive? What did they plant, or what did they do? Uh, <clears throat> they had cows, uh, and. Uh, Uncle Dennis had uh, uh, a few horses and uh, and mules, uh, and uh, they uh, they raised uh, oh, uh, crops. They uh, they had. Uh, uh, 
uncle has had uh, great vineyards. He had uh, uh, planted corn, uh, peanuts. Uh, they had uh, spots of uh, oh, uh, grain, uh, mostly just enough to uh, <coughs> uh, feed the, the cattle. Mm. And uh, so when uh, my uh, uh, grandma and grandma came to town, uh, they had their building, I mean they had their home, and then uh, back uh, on the corner, uh, had a barn and uh, had uh, chickens and uh, and cows. And uh, after my uh, grand grandfather died, she continued, and I I stayed with her. Uh, and uh, started in sixth grade, and uh, I stayed uh, well four years and uh, living with her and helping take care of things yeah and <clears throat> she was really independent uh, uh, I wasn't taking care of her as much as she is taking care of me because I'd be out gathered eggs uh, and uh did a few chores, but uh, all the housework, the cooking, everything. She did everything in the house, and uh, uh, I would uh, deliver eggs to uh, uh, most of her eggs went to uh, the White Away Cafe because. Uh, uh, after she managed to sell them her first first eggs, why uh, she had uh, buff orphans and chickens, and they laid big eggs. What kind and of chicken? Buff orphans. Okay. She didn't like leggers at all. They were too small. Didn't lay big eggs, and she wanted the big eggs. So. <laughs> What do you remember about holidays? Like, is the Fourth of July you have early memories of what the or, or Christmas time? What are your what's your earliest holiday memories oh. growing up? Well, uh, of course, with with older brothers and a sister, uh, from from ever since I was small. Everyone had Christmas at, at our house. And when my brother got married and, uh, oh, uh, <clears throat> they'd always come back and as we grew up, uh, around Christmas time, that, that's when you always went, went to my folks. That was, uh, and, uh, so ours was, of course, see, I lived through, uh, the Dust Bowl, uh, we were poor and I didn't know it, uh, if, uh, <coughs> when, uh, The things that you could you could buy with pennies, two cents a loaf for bread. Uh, shows five cents. Uh, for, for what? For the theater, the show. The shows five cents. Five cents. And where was that theater? Uh. 
it was the gym theater, and uh, you know, <clears throat> you know where uh, uh, they're building the uh, oh uh, the restaurant in town. Here on this side of Second Street, or, or? yeah, mm-hmm. uh, okay. Right next door was the gym theater. Uh, McCall's has it now. But uh, that was the gym theater. Uh, where uh, <clears throat> the old theater on the corner up here, uh, they uh, that was an open air theater. And uh, the screen was uh, next to uh, the sidewalk. And uh, you entered from uh, the alley, uh, and it was sloped down and uh, was open. Would people open. sneak in to try to get the show? Oh, well, uh, that was... Everyone, all the kids always tried to sneak into everything. Uh, <clears throat> but, uh, old man, uh, Spearman, uh, had, uh, had the theater in his life, and, uh, when they built the, the new theater on the, on the corner, why, uh, People, uh, he would hire anyone that wanted to come and lay up rock. And next time you pass by it, if you'll just look at the wall, you'll see where they stop building. And uh, I think uh, it might have. Uh, try to think. I really don't remember how many, you might say, stabs at it it took, but you can see where they quit laying. Mm-hmm. And he would tell people, said, we're out of money. So you're going to have to get people to go come to the show. <laughs> and said, when you get more money, why we'll go back to work. And so it shows on the wall where they stop building. But anyway, that was, they built it, and, uh, but, uh, that was a little later, because, uh, during, during the sandstorms, that was a terrible time, because, uh, never really saw the sun. Just sand in the air. And, uh, the houses were not built as well as they're built now. Uh, and so there was just a settling of, of, of sand in, in the house. And, uh, of course if you started sweeping it up, that's why it would Circulated in the house some more, you know. It was, uh. <clears throat> what grade were you in or what age you, uh, I was, uh, that was while I was in, uh, first through the fourth, somewhere in there. Were you, yeah. where was your school? Were, you weren't going to school up, up here? No, we had West Side School. West Side School. Well, it was, by the time I went to school, it was Lowell School. Uh, when it was originally built, <coughs> that and uh, Kingsley were the two schools. And they were two-story. And uh, there was... Uh, 
Oh, uh, two two rooms upstairs, and uh, there was four rooms downstairs. And by the time I went to school, the school had been condemned, and <clears throat> they re redid it. And uh, for my first two years, uh, we uh, we had outside toilets at school, and uh, well, or uh, everywhere. I mean, everyone had outhouses. Well, yeah. the, these houses, like I said, I'll show show you the houses. But this house was a four room house. One room, two rooms, three rooms, four rooms. Four rooms house. No running water. No, no toilet. Uh, the well and the toilet were outside. You had, uh, a, uh, <clears throat> My grandmother had a uh, a cellar with a small, what they called a smokehouse, over the cellar. This one, the cellar is just outside the door, and you stepped out on a concrete slab, which was the top of the cellar, and you enter it from over here to go down into it. So, like, Black Sunday, when they talk about the big storm, were there particular times in the Dust Bowl that you remember being intensely bad, and then other times where it was just, the sky, well, I mean, the sky was, just, yeah. was the sky black, red, orange, what was, what did it look like? It was a, uh, <clears throat> had a red, reddish tint, because that's the sand around here. And uh, when the sun let up, why, of course, the the dirt and sand would settle a little bit. Sun, I mean, the, <clears throat> when the uh, wind began to blow, uh, my mom would take... Uh, uh, a uh, and wet a sheet to put on uh, the windows and all on the north or the south, depending on which direction the wind was blowing. So, uh, but and was that did that go on for months or years or how how long you would use? And did people talk about that in biblical terms? Did they think God had cursed the land? or how did, What did people think about and say yeah. about the dust at that time? They just knew the farmers had plowed up too much land? or I mean, what did they say? They just, it? you know, it just dust. And, and we were in the city, uh, but <clears throat> you go uh, north and west of here. Uh, the sand... Uh, Blew up, had a pretty, pretty steady fence. It'd start piling up, just like snow would. And you'll see pictures, uh, of it where here's these big mounds of sand. And so that wasn't just out in the panhandle, yeah. that was not far from here. Right. And <clears throat> the thing, Went <clears throat> Sunday, I was, went to church uh, up in Stillwater, <clears throat> and uh, the uh, preacher's daughter, who is uh, not ordained yet, but uh, is going to be a teacher. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, 
gave a sermon, and in her sermon, before as she started, she said that uh, she was from Texas, but uh, she is now in Oklahoma. Said I am a Oki. After the sermon was over, why well, I, uh, I reminded her that uh, the Okies were the ones that left the state of Oklahoma and went to California and they got the name Oki. And uh, <clears throat> if you live in Oklahoma, you're either a cowboy or a sooner. <laughs> well, speaking of that, did any of your family leave during the Dust Bowl? Or no. did everybody stay? No, Please. everybody stayed. Do you remember anybody talking about leaving? Did they think about no. that? No. They had uh, had their land uh, built in. My uh, my father at that time was uh, uh, grading roads. He uh, was working for the county. Uh, <coughs> he uh, he graded roads. Uh, started. With uh, uh, horses, horse-drawn, uh, oh, uh, maintenance uh, graders, they call them, and uh, <coughs> he drove the first caterpillar tractor that the county had uh, <coughs> to. Uh, Grade roads. So uh, uh, he worked for the county, and uh, in uh, it would have been uh, around uh, 1935, 36. <coughs> uh, he. Uh, he voted for his boss who was beaten in the election and the new county commissioner that came in uh, fired everybody that didn't vote for him. So, uh, <clears throat> to uh, keep the family alive, he uh, uh, cut wood. Of course, he knew everyone in uh, this part of the county and uh, so he would go help them clean their land for the wood <coughs> to clear it and he would clear he would clear land uh, had an old Ford truck uh, <coughs> that uh, would uh slip out of gear and uh, so when when you drove why of course you would shift it when you got into high had a uh, a four inch board that had a notch cut in it and you'd put the notch on the uh, shift and uh of course, the other uh, on the dash to hold it in place, and you'd, you'd drive. It wouldn't slip out of gear then. Huh? It wouldn't slip out of gear. <laughs> but did you learn to drive on that truck? No. Uh, I uh, <coughs> only my two bigger older brothers uh, got to do that, but. He would take the <clears throat> the logs, throw it on the truck, bring it in, and uh, unload it uh, every day after. Then on <clears throat> on the weekend, when uh, we were out of school, why he'd hook up the bus saw and he'd cut the wood up into uh, uh, sixteen inch. Uh, pieces and uh, rick it up and he sold uh, 
He sold wood for 25 cents a rick. Oh my gosh. And uh, Now why do everyone say rick here instead of cord? Because uh, I, uh, a rick is one half a cord. A cord is a four by four by four. And a rick is a uh, 16 by 4 by 4. And uh, so, that's how. Did you... Did your dad ever go back to grading roads for the county? Or did yes, he did. He, uh, <coughs> he went back uh, and then uh, he uh, he retired from the county, and uh, <clears throat> because of his skill, uh, the city hired him to maintain the uh, streets in town because uh, everything was gravel. There was uh, oh uh, <clears throat> the uh, Broadway was uh, concrete and brick. The road coming in was uh, was brick, and everything going uh, east all the way to uh, Guthrie was uh, a brick highway. And uh, the uh, (coughs) concrete uh, road from the center of town to uh, Fritz uh, to uh, 3rd Street uh, was was paved. When was the first paved road put in it, do you think? Uh, I don't know because uh, I don't uh, don't remember anything except our road in front of our house was paved. And, uh, but you were saying Second Street was kind of the main street too, right? I mean, it was not all the way through. Uh, <clears throat> you coming down Second Street uh, before you got to the railroad track, which was uh, <clears throat> Santa Fe Land. There was big pillars up there because. The depot set on Second Street, hmm. and then you get around on the other side. Why you take Second Street on on down? So Second Street didn't go all the way down. And <clears throat> I'll, uh, I was a kid when uh, they. Uh, Oh, paved Third uh, Street from uh, Broadway down to uh, Fritz, and uh, then it was gravel from there on on out. And uh, Highway 66 and 77 came from the State Capitol Building into Edmond out to the Bradbury corner or the three mile corner. Seventy seven went north and sixty six went uh, on up through Tulsa. So the Bradbury corner on the other side of I thirty five or how far down is it? Uh Bradbury corner was uh on uh oh uh, before you get to 
July 35, year. Brett Barry Corner would be on the corner of 2nd and I-35. Okay. So how about you in school? What did you do in school? And somewhere along the line, UCO got built, right, when you were growing up? Or was that, it was, was it already there? It was built. And, uh, my grandfather is the one that, uh, <clears throat> told him how much rock it would take to build the building. And he was a rock mason. And, uh, of course I didn't know until years later that he was the one that, uh, uh, was uh, the contractor for for the building of it. And then we're talking and about he, Old North? Old North Tower. Because that is the first building? That's the first building. And they played basketball in the, on the top top floor of the building. <laughs> uh, and uh, <clears throat> I went to uh, I went to the fourth grade up at uh, Central, and uh, oh, uh, uh, <clears throat> when you say Central, are you talking about not Central Middle School now, or, or is that what you're talking about across from our church? No, Central. Central State Teachers Conference. Oh, it's Central State. Okay. Central you State. You went to fourth grade there? I went to fourth grade there. How did that happen? Because they had a demonstration school. Oh. Uh, <clears throat> you might as well know that uh, I'm dyslexic. I didn't know it. But uh <clears throat> but I was the dummy in school. And uh so uh <clears throat> the uh I made it through the third grade uh memorizing pictures. If uh when uh, <clears throat> when we were learning to read, we had our readers, and uh, the uh, you'd get in in a circle, and uh, then you'd read paragraphs and just go go around. <clears throat> and uh, had pictures and. Uh, when they would read, I would, uh, I made out some of the, some of the words before they got turned around and the, uh, uh, but I'd see the picture and I would remember what someone had read. I'd see that picture and I'd just go ahead and read it like I knew what I was doing. And, uh, so when it entered the fourth grade, why, uh, oh, uh, my mother got real disgusted with the teacher. They were talking about I wasn't doing, getting, getting my work, my, uh, uh, doing my math real well, and, uh, but I couldn't read, and uh, so she sent me up to uh, enroll me in the, the demonstration school. How how did that go? Oh, went well, real, real well, but I still have trouble reading. I was going to say, did they know about dyslexia at that time? No, they didn't know. What I was seeing on a on a page, uh, and uh, I really didn't know about dyslexia till I had two kids that had it. 
So, uh, they, uh, uh, they know what to do now to help kids. And, uh, in fact, my daughter is, is a reverend and, uh, does real well. And, uh, my youngest son, uh, is, uh, retired chemical engineer that, uh, ran B&W's, uh, Oh, uh, nuclear reprocessing, uh, plant. And, uh, he's now working for a company after retiring. They came to him and a French company has bought up all the nuclear plants in the United States. And they came to him and said, hey, we're having trouble. We've got, uh, we don't know what we've got out here. We've got engineers and so on, but we need help. They <clears throat> talked him into, he's independent now. Oh, gosh. He takes off when he wants to. <laughs> but anyway, he's a, his son is, is working with, uh, with them. And, uh, he told me he's coming, coming to, uh, my birthday, uh, and, uh, said that Ryan can't go because uh, they have an outage in uh, is it Carolina? Mm-hmm. I think it's Carolina. Mm-hmm. Uh, but anyway, they have an outage. He said uh, that he'll be there a while and won't be coming. Mm-hmm. So. Well, what was your pathway to the Army? Because I know <clears throat> you ended up joining the Army and you were in World War II <clears throat> school-wise. How did, what age were you and how did that come to happen? Well, uh, I was in the Boy Scouts. Uh, had two brothers in the National Guard. And uh, when... <clears throat> When I was going uh, going to junior high, uh, up where Russell Doherty is now, uh, I would come by the armory, or really it was it was Mitchell Hall. Mitchell had built a building in downtown Edmond, which was a a big hall that uh, he built to rent to the college to play basketball in. Well, they uh, built the, uh, the basketball uh, court Oh, swimming pool and, and all. <clears throat> and, uh, so they rented out the hall and made it a skating rink. And they also <clears throat> rented the use of it, uh, for the National Guard. And the National Guard had this big room in, uh, the north end of it where they had their, uh, Oh, uh, equipment, rifles, and, and so on. <clears throat> and uh, I drop by and uh, 
watch what was going on and uh, got real real interested. Well, they in the meantime they built uh, 1937 uh, built the National Guard Army, which is on uh, Bobard and the museum. Yeah. Which is the museum, right? They built it. <coughs> well, uh, in uh, thirty-eight, uh, I got to going down there and asking about, you know, getting in. Uh, I uh, <clears throat> I got my eagle in uh, April of 1940. September the 16th of 1940. Uh, I was in the National Guard by this time. I went to summer camp in uh, 1938. Uh, I was a member of the National Guard. I wasn't. But I thought I was. I went to camp, stood muster, and uh, got paid and, uh, well, it sounds like you remember if you were getting paid and going through the drill. Well, the thing was, <clears throat> they were still using the uh, the old system that uh, you could be a member of the National Guard and pay someone to take your place to go to camp, go to drill. And you're still there. You're getting your promotions and so on. But and you're paying somebody else to go for you? Oh well, yeah. During the during the Civil War, people paid someone else to take their place. Didn't you know this? Yeah. Oh yes. Oh. So it wasn't until uh, January of. Uh, Thirty-nine, and uh, like I say, this came up later when they were, you know, doing my time of service, and I said, "Well, I was in in thirty-eight. I went to went to camp." They said you weren't a member until the ninth of January. Hmm. 1939. Well, had you been serving for somebody else then, or how did that come to happen? I was serving for somebody else, but I was getting paid for it. Did you, but you didn't realize it. No, I didn't. Shoot, I was making drill just. Oh wow! But anyway, <clears throat> did you know war was coming at that time? Oh no, no, no. Really? No. Because Europe in '39 was, I think, when the Blitzkrieg in Poland and stuff. So there was stuff happening in Europe, but you didn't know that we oh, were going to war. I knew there was a war going on in Europe. But America but didn't it, think that we would inevitably be drawn in at that point. That wasn't. What did your son, son think about uh, Iraq and uh, and all? Given Distant it things, you know. All right. Yeah. I'm a kid. Yeah. So, September. Uh, September, uh, of course, just started my junior year in high school. And uh, the colonel called me in, and uh, I, not colonel, uh, Captain Messina B. Murray. This is the governor's son. He called me in the orderly room and uh, said, Little Pete, said, I'm going to discharge you. And I thought I'd done something wrong. And uh, <clears throat> I said, well, what are my brothers? No, no, he told me. But I asked him why. And he said, well, we're going to be inducted. I didn't know what inducted meant. didn't mean anything to me. 
said, we're going to be inducted, and uh, I'm discharging everybody that's in school uh, because we're going to go on active duty for one year. Well, something else that I didn't know, my brother went home and told my mother that he thought it would be a good idea if I went on active duty for one year, said I'd be bigger and stronger, come back and play football, which I loved, and uh, he can, <coughs> oh, uh, uh, he'll do him some good, he can come home with a little money in his pocket. And uh, she said, well, will you take care of him? Well, yeah, okay. That's how I got to stay in. So on, like I say, September, we're inducted. We all moved down to the armory. Here in Oklahoma City or the one in Edmond? In Edmond. That's our... Because it was built in 37 and that's where that, you lived there? You moved there? We moved there. They brought cots in, and we're in the Army. Now, why were, is this just a regular thing the National Guard would do? Why? why uh, this is the first, first time. And they, uh, President Roosevelt called up a few National Guard units. California was one. We were one. Uh, I don't know if 36 was, was called up at that time or not, but anyway, uh, there was just a few National Guard units. And we went to, <coughs> oh, uh, Fort Sill. But we were here, or we were, stayed at the armory for We might have been there a week. So you had done basic training at Fort Sill? We haven't. No. Haven't done that yet? No. We're still, we're at the Armory. Okay. So then they move us, finally, say it's time to move, so they, <clears throat> they moved us to, uh, we went by train, by the way. And about how many people would this have been that were activated in Edmond for the unit? Seventy-eight. And your brother, both your older brothers were in there? Both my brothers. And there were 78 of us. There's two of us left. Barney in Florida and me. But anyway, uh, we were at Fort Sill until... Uh, 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 November, in November, we moved to Barclay, Texas. And that would have been in 41, right? So November, November, no, this is the same year. So September, same. and then by November, you were in Barclay, Texas. Right. What were you doing at that time? Were they having you do drills and march? Oh, we, were, we, were, we were doing drills. We were uh, doing formations. Uh, uh, Shooting and practicing your marksmanship? Marksmanship, uh Going through calisthenics, getting in shape, doing doing what the army does. Of course, didn't have all the equipment that you would normally have, and you've read about how they used uh, <coughs> mortar uh, sections would have pistol pipe that they uh, was a mortar and uh, drop rocks in it as though they were. Uh, but anyway, uh, <clears throat> when we uh, went to Camp Barkley, uh, we were there, and this is just outside of Abilene. And uh, while uh, uh, we were going to town, uh, going to the show, and uh, enjoying ourselves and uh, <clears throat> then uh, 
December, December the 7th, uh, I was in the theater in, uh, on, uh, Abilene. And, uh, the theater had a, uh, a big, uh, white screen. It was a, really a board painted white up next to the, to the screen. And, uh, they would flash messages up there. And they put that up for, for the army. And that, uh, if a commander wanted someone, he would tell them and they would flash the name up, report. And, uh, came up, all soldiers report to your units. Well, uh, this was, uh, the picture, Sergeant York. And it's real interesting, it's right at, interesting part. They had already gone to war. And, uh, not, not a few people left. Came back on, you know, and all soldiers report to your units. And I'm thinking, gosh, uh, can't be that important. <coughs> and while I'm thinking whether I should go or not, the lights came on. The picture went off, and uh, someone went to the stage and said, Everyone, back to your units, because over two-thirds of us was soldiers in in the place. So went out, (coughs) and people, before we got to the bus stop to, to pick up the bus, why the word was out that Pearl Harbor had been bought. And, uh, I never, <laughs> I never forget going on the bus, going out. One of the guys said, uh, uh, so they borrow, <coughs> don't remember the exact word, but something to the effect, so they bombed Pearl Harbor. What in the hell are we going to camp for? <laughs> Well, we were in for the duration. And you had been in in September, and this was December. And this was December the 7th. So you'd been in the Army for a few months. Yeah. And then Pearl Harbor. And Pearl Harbor. (laughs) So, of course, the history, Louisiana maneuvers, big marches, uh, what are Louisiana maneuvers? Change. What? What are Louisiana maneuvers? This is the National Guard and the Army first time that this ever come, uh, really? Had a, a joint activity or yeah. joint mission? Mm-hmm. Huh. And, uh, uh, <clears throat> we moved to, uh, from there, well, all of this activity now starts in that we're a square division. Uh, that's outmoded. Uh, we're still part is still using horses. Uh, our, uh, our parades, the officer of war rode horses in in the parade. But uh, 
we were getting sedans and and all and uh they triangulized the division from a square to a triangular division, which meant that one of our regiments moved out and uh <clears throat> went to uh the Panama Canal and then eventually to the Pacific. That was the uh 158. We had like 158. Third, you divided into three parts then for the triangle? Three, three regiments. Okay. And each one of us had uh, uh, artillery support from the uh, <clears throat> the 105s and uh, the 155s was in support and uh, so we had to get used to our communications. Were the 78 of you still together as one group? Yes, and we were headquarters. We were headquarters company, 179th Infantry. And you then were put in part of a larger unit based out of Fort Sill, or where? No, was the... no. We had a division. Our division was made up of the Oklahoma National Guard. The uh, Colorado National Guard, uh, New Mexico, and Arizona. Wow. See, the National Guard was small units. See, we only hit uh, the Edmund, the National Guard in Edmond now, although we don't have a division, uh, the Armory uh, services roughly 200 people. What was the name of your division? 45th Infantry Division. The Thunderbirds. And that's the one that we have the museum down in yeah. Oklahoma City for. Okay, I'm putting the pieces together. Okay. So we, uh, we went, uh, <coughs> after we had, had uh, done that. Did you go down to Panama, the Panama Canal? Oh, no. That was just... I'm the 179th. Okay. There, there were two brigades, the uh, 89th and the 90th, and we were in the 90th. The 89th Brigade uh, had the 170, uh, 158, and the 100, and the 157th and the 158th. So they took the 158th out which left the 179th, the 180th, and the 157th. That made up the three. Then we moved <coughs> uh, to uh, Fort Devens, Massachusetts. And when we moved to Massachusetts, up until this time, <coughs> all the communications... Uh, came out of Regimental Headquarters Company, which, which I was in. And uh, there was uh, the in, uh, intelligence and uh, some of the other uh, units with for a company uh, <coughs> We had this small battalion headquarters that just consisted of officers and very few enlisted men. And when you went to the field, then all the support and uh, communications and everything made up the company. And then when you finished, you came back to your unit. Well, when we got to Devon, they said, that doesn't work. We've got to have a battalion headquarters company complete with the communications, the intelligence, uh, the administration, everything. So, they uh, 
said they needed uh, people to fill those those positions. So, uh, of course, conversation going around. Well, what's going to happen if you get over there? And uh, <clears throat> oh, uh, someone told me that uh, I was in the message center of the regimental headquarters and I said uh, what position is over there and they said well message center chief I'm a first third what does that mean that I was your... first class I was a first class third rated specialist now you started what? private still was private low, Lois and then you moved up from there yes my, I was still a private. Okay. But uh, I had I had moved up in pay scales from a first. I mean, from a from a private to a private first class, private second class, private third class. I made. <coughs> I was making as much as a buck sergeant was making. So, uh, <clears throat> they said uh, uh, the message center chief job is open. Well, message center chief is, uh, is staff sergeant. That's three up and one below. So I said, I'll do that. And, uh, of course, my uh, <coughs> brother came around wanted to know what in the hell I was going to do. <coughs> and I told him. Lots of time. Uh, you uh, want drink? I'll take a glass of water if you've got. You gonna get one? Yeah, he was. He was. Told him you'd be go over and be the chief. I was going to be the message center chief, <clears throat> and uh, he wanted to know why. And I said, "Well, I said I'm going to be a non commissioned officer." And he said, <clears throat> he "said Well, okay." I, I reminded him that. Uh, I was only only going to be about fifty yards from uh, in the barracks from where I was there. So <coughs> we trained there, <coughs> and uh, had you been trained in communications? Is that what you had done with this unit? Oh yes. So mm -hmm. you, and communications at that time meant what? Was that all radios or? <coughs> Radios, uh, <coughs> oh, uh, wire section, and there was <coughs> three three sections in in the communication platoon. Wire section would lay wire <coughs> from point right. to point, and that was really <coughs> that and runners was most of the way through war. <coughs> uh, was commanders talked on the telephone. Hmm. 
<coughs> when we were inducted, we had radios <coughs> that uh, UCW and uh, they were powered with uh, little square generators like this <coughs> on a uh, tripod that had a seat on it. Two seats go out and one coming back and then it had a little deal to sit on. You'd sit there and crank it <coughs> and uh, I'd sit there. Uh, Would you do Morse code on them? Or is it all I different? never did do Morse code. I went to <coughs> Morse code school. <coughs> but I I couldn't do it. I uh, <coughs> didn't make sense to me. It just I know the code, but I couldn't read it. Uh, <coughs> Jack Barber. I tell this about Jack. <coughs> Jack could use a speed key. And to the pressing down one, you know, you push it one way as a dot, you push it back, it's a dash. And, uh, he could sit there <coughs> and, uh, uh, we had code and our coders, uh, was, uh, four letter groups. And uh, he could sit there and uh, work work that thing, and it was fast, just as fast as he could. He would send a message, carry on a conversation, and drink whiskey all at the same time, and never be never miss a beat on any of it. So multitasking is nothing new to oh, guys, the service. Th- and a lot of these radio operators were that good. But anyway, <coughs> uh, so it was that. Right after we got <coughs> to uh, oh, uh, Barclay, we got our first radios. Now, we had uh, walkie-talkies before... Uh, we had gotten them in, <coughs> uh, probably six, six, seven months before we, we were inducted. Uh, the, the radio and battery weighed 25 pounds. And, on a <clears throat> with a fresh battery on a good day almost line of sight uh, you could get five miles the uh, handheld walkie talkies have you seen they're about that big those walkie talkies <coughs> on a good day, line of sight, <laughs> you could get them out. Oh, wow. So you can see why that wire was in, important. Mm-hmm. And uh, <coughs> we had uh, uh, WD. 130, they called it. It was uh, wire with rubber and uh, a cloth covering. Two strands and came on a big drum and we had half a mile and a mile drums. And uh, so when when we strung strung wire wise that's what you use that and a commander 
just as soon as he stopped, the wire team was right behind him with clips that they clipped onto that thing so that he could he could talk. But that gets us off of Massachusetts. Did, when you, when you the uh, chief, did, so did they let you become the chief? I was the chief. They did. I did you over. did you become a staff sergeant then? I became a staff sergeant. That's a pretty big promotion all at once, isn't it? Uh, it's a big promotion, but uh, not pay grade. Uh, and you're still seven, are you seventeen at this point? Oh no! Uh-uh. By this point, uh, well, if it's forty-one, you're twenty-one. Yeah. Uh, you're twenty. You're twenty. Getting not yet. But anyway, I go. We go from there. Well, while we're there, Patton visits the uh, uh, visits us, watches some of the training, and we prayed it and uh, and all. And he called the uh, officers to the uh, or had them all in in the theater. <clears throat> and talked to him and uh, said that uh, he was on, on his way to North Africa and uh, they had given him a choice of uh, divisions that were ready to go and uh, he wanted to command the uh, commander for the morale of his troops but their discipline is for shit. <laughs> so right after right after that we went up to uh <clears throat> Pine Camp, New York. That's in a very northern <clears throat> part of New York. And it snows up there. Didn't blow. Just straight down, but a bunch of snow. Mm. And we did a lot of tunneling. Hmm. In the snow? Yes, had to. The, uh, there would be, uh, snow drifts that would, uh, cover a, a barracks up to the first level. You could look out a window or anything. I mean, it, solid snow mm. and uh, <clears throat> if your entrance was on the north uh, you couldn't get out the door without going out and digging holes mm. and uh, you had to dig dig the holes out for the kitchen and, and all and we did our training uh in the barracks. And we had what we call sky hooks. And uh, these are big uh, sea clamps type screw in and you'd lift the cots up and hook them to the ceiling. So they'd be out of the way for you to and then be able to You'd have your, you had a classroom, you drill big enough to drill in, Mm -hmm. and uh, so, uh, then we left there, and uh, uh, we were in winter gear, heavy overcoats and all of that, got on the train and uh, went to... uh, uh, Virginia and uh, we uh, by the time we got to Virginia we'd shed all of our overcoats and all that heavy gear and uh, because it was we'd been used to real cold weather and, and we were burning up but uh 
we were there, and from there, we let on all the ship, went to North Africa, and uh, we met Patton. We, we made it an amphibious landing. We, of course, practiced all of this, and uh, going up and down the ladders, and uh, getting in the boats. And so when we got there, why we unloaded. I didn't even give it a thought. <clears throat> and I really thought that we were making a an amphibious landing in North Africa. We made an amphibious landing, but nobody was there but Patton. Hmm. Going up and down the <clears throat> raising hell. Was that in Libya or what no. part of Africa would that have been? Uh, Morocco? This was... Uh, Oh gosh. Tunisia, Egypt? Uh, oh, gosh. Sudan's not there. Uh, trying to, uh. That's okay. Man. So, had all, just said, what? had all the soldiers, I mean, you said there wasn't anybody there. Had had they already they brought had, them back? And, and uh, uh, the Germans had had given up at this point. Uh, Tunisia. Tunisia. And uh, <clears throat> he told us what was ahead. Talked to the officers and non-coms. Were you under Patton then at that time? We were under Patton. Patton was uh, did he the think core. He was the core commander. Did he think your discipline had improved at some point? Not yet. <laughs> uh, it wasn't until uh, we uh, we had landed in in Sicily and uh, had gone through. Uh, <coughs> the Sicilian campaign that uh, he uh, he spoke to the troops and uh, with a little bit of beautiful profanity that <laughs> that he chose well he he did a, he did a great job with <laughs> when he spoke uh he uh, told how proud he was and, and so on. And uh, when you go to the armory, <coughs> uh, go to the museum down there, uh, you'll read his speech that he gave uh, something to the effect that uh, when the uh, history is written, uh, it will be uh, written <coughs> by the pen of the uh, quill that was dipped in the blood of the Thunderbird. You've read that. Okay. So, uh, so no action really against the enemy in North Africa. Nothing in North Africa. And so you all we landed. We landed in uh, in Sicily. And <clears throat> Montgomery took the right flank and was going up the highway to Messina. And that was his objective. And Patton was to perfect, protect Montgomery's flank. And so we landed, Montgomery landed, goes this way. As we go in, and our, our landing was simple. I mean, uh, there wasn't a shot fired. And uh, after we <coughs> pulled in, uh, why uh, the uh, commander uh, uh, came in with his his jeep, and uh, 
He said his uh, executive officer uh, told the executive officer he wanted him to make a recon of uh, of the area. And uh, he said, well, <clears throat> I need someone to ride a shotgun. I volunteer for everything. Heck, it doesn't make any difference what, what it is. I volunteer. But I saw that Jeep. That's a ride. And I immediately said, well, I can do that. So I got on on the Jeep. We went out. I'm man, this is a whole new country. Gosh, it's it's different. Real neat. I'm looking around, man, you know, great. And the major is raising hell with me. Uh I'm not paying attention. I, I am paying attention. I'm looking at everything. <laughs> well, we drive around and finally come back to uh, uh, to where we started and uh, the commander uh, <coughs> put a map down on the hood of the jeep and said uh, where did you go? And that major leaned over and looked at that map and I'm thinking, that son of a bitch can't even read a map. So, old smart aleck me, I, I'm an Eagle Scout. Man, I know my map reading, so I said, well, sir, just hunker it up. I said, we start right here. We went right down here and here. Went right up here and down here and came back. And he said, what's right there? And I said, that's that hill that's over there. And he said, uh, and I said, we get what, we went around that one. He said, uh, can you guide the battalion to our objective? I said, sure. He said, report to E Company and take the point. Stupid. So I report to E Company. I've already been out here. Come on, gang, let's go. And they're, yep, slow down. They're not to slow down for it. There's nothing out here. I've been here before. We got to our objective. Stayed overnight. And, uh, next day, why, we started out for a, uh, Armored car came down down the highway uh, or the road, and uh, one of the guys took a rifle grenade, and fired it, hit it right on the side, bounced off, didn't pull the pin. Uh, of course, it took off, and. Uh, Guy shot at it as it pulling away. Uh, then, oh, right after uh, noon, should be around one, two o'clock. Big explosion, and uh, <clears throat> don't know until later on that there was a ammunition truck that was on its uh, way into uh, Camiso Airport and uh, they hit it with a uh, rocket launcher and uh, of course it, the whole thing blew up trees everything around so by the time we got there uh I'm back at the unit uh, with my runners, and uh, the guys are stringing their wire. We get on uh, the airport, 
And uh, I got my uh, my souvenir there. My, uh, everyone wanted a, a German swastika. Mm. And I got mine there and carried it all the way through, changing it from place to place until... And all of my... Uh, all of my platoon signed it. Mm. And I, and I've got it. But anyway. But, uh, Patton, uh, of course you know he didn't get along with Montgomery. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> I think it was out of spite that, uh, he changed the course instead of protecting his flank. He headed for Palermo. That's the capital of Sicily. And, uh, we took Palermo and, uh, had ice cream and, uh. That was high living at that time, wasn't it? And then, uh, then we headed across. We had started having a lot of trouble. Our fighting was sparse. Uh, we'd run into a little bit of resistance, and uh, uh, <clears throat> shoot, our our units were. They had their fire and maneuver down to where it was an art. Hmm. And, uh, were they Germans that were retreating, or were they Italians, or both, or who, who were uh, the enemy? The Italians had already given up. Mm. So these were Germans then that were. This, this is Germans. And then, then of course, uh, by the time, <coughs> uh, Montgomery got to Messina about the same time that our troops it got there. But we were late in that the Germans had taken everything they had and and crossed the channel. It was to well, leave Sicily behind. Abandon Sicily. Yeah. So then of course our next objective was to uh uh we'd been in battle the 36th Division was <clears throat> given the, the task uh, of uh, taking uh, Salerno, and uh, we were in floating reserve, which meant that uh, we wouldn't go until they'd uh, established a beachhead. And, uh, that would take two, maybe three days. So, we were aboard ship, you know, just lounging around. And they, uh, uh, put the call to the boats. And at two o'clock in the afternoon, why, we were, we were going down the ladder onto the onto the boats and uh, we went in and uh, the Germans had this range of mountains and they're they're looking down our throat and what beach was this or what area was was this landing because this was on the mainland of Italy this This wasn't Sicily this is mainland of Italy this is mainland Italy this is on uh, on the boot where <clears throat> the boot comes down and out, right. Salerno is right in here. Okay. And uh, so you were getting there a lot earlier because you thought you'd be going in after the beachhead was. Oh yeah. But uh, they Third uh, <clears throat> uh, Sixth Division they really chopped them up. 
And uh, Mark Clark, by this time, <coughs> was uh, was the commander. And uh, he took Patton's place. Of course, you know that story. What happened to Patton? Was he relieved of duty because of Montgomery's? Uh, no. His, his relief because he uh, slapped a uh, soldier uh, at uh, an aid station. Patton went back to uh, check the wounded and he asked the kid what was wrong with him and he was scared. And uh, Patton took his... Uh, gloves and slapped him across the face and said, you're a coward. Said, I don't put up with cowards in my outfit. Well, the thing is, you have uh, newspaper men following generals around there to get a story, and here it was. High-ranking general slapping a a poor, sick soldier. And so, uh, oh. That wasn't the end of his career, though. Because didn't he still command in Germany? Oh, well, yeah, but, see, they put, uh. Was he a two star uh, at that point, or what was he? What? Was he a two star at that point, or a three star, or I wonder. Patton. He, he was a two star. He was a two star. Yeah. And, uh, he, uh, oh, uh, they, uh, they set up a dummy, uh, army, uh, in, uh, <clears throat> in England. To fake, to try to trick the Germans? Uh, had, uh, trucks and, uh, oh, uh, <clears throat> guns and, uh, all kinds of stuff. All rubber balloons. Uh, and, uh, they had, uh, uh, Did all kinds of fake stuff that at any time that any airplane was in the air while they were out, uh, pushing these, uh, trucks around and give a, and here's this big army that they had and it was nothing but, uh, these big, big balloons. Mm. Uh, and, uh, of course he's flaunching at the bits all the time. And, uh, uh, we went, <clears throat> the one thing that, uh, <clears throat> after we got, after we got ashore, Clark had already put out the word <coughs> that uh, a beachhead was unattainable and that he was getting ready to give the command to uh, uh, go back to the ships. And uh, <coughs> The 45th Division commander, our commander, said, just set the ammunition behind us because we're going to stay. Well, then Mark Clark had to tell Eisenhower that uh, he had changed his mind and that we were going to stay. And, but... Uh, this was, uh, for us, this was the toughest, or the first of the toughest battles that we had gotten into. 
Uh, in fact, the uh, the Germans had <coughs> was uh, forming to uh, enter tanks, and the infantry was getting prepared and all, and. Uh, uh, from my position out there and there is nothing between the line that I'm on and the Germans. And uh, it's inevitable uh, with the firepower and with what they've got and all uh They're nothing. It's inevitable that what? That they're going to knock you guys off? Oh, yeah. They're, they're, they're coming. Right? <clears throat> well, I guess you're talking about my religion. I, uh, I've been to Sunday school. Uh, I knew about God and Jesus. But uh, my prayer life was, as Pat would say, but uh, I thought, you know, I guess, you know, this is not near as much fun as I thought it was going to be. Did you think that, I, was it, that was it? It was going to be And uh, I did some serious praying. Of course, since I, I know that uh, I thought I was making a bargain. All the things that I, I'm going to do. Uh but uh, get me out of this one. Man, no more than I said, get me out of here. Two planes I've never seen in my life was P-38s, and there was two of them. Those P-38s came right right over us and started their strafing runs feeling back and going up and down. They tore up the German line. Thank you, God. I've been trying my best to keep my promises. I'm here because of the planes he sent me. Of course, I know everyone was praying, but those were my planes. <laughs> but we we moved out of there, of course. Then, of course, all the battles, the reply. Uh, Rapido and the rivers that we had to cross and all of the things that uh, Monte Cassino that was a place that we couldn't get around uh, thousands of lives were lost there and uh, so they they took us they took our division the third division uh, were you headed to Rome at this point? Was that your objective? Or what our you objective, driving? our objective was Rome. So we pulled out and uh, made an amphibious landing at uh, at Anzio. And uh, you know the story of Anzio. Uh, <clears throat> we had a. had put in command uh, of the landing and uh, 
Shoot, my, my job, one of my jobs was to find the uh, command post. Uh, the enemy command post? What? The enemy command post? Or no. Establish your command post. Establish our command post. Right. Because uh, you had to have a center. Every time you made your move, you didn't move out of here until you had established Another command post. Had the wire in. Had the messengers there. And, and all. And, uh, <clears throat> so, the signal officer has the responsibility for establishing. And, uh, we've spent a lot of time, uh, learning what a good command post was, uh, getting in, getting out, uh, uh, lines of communication, uh, how can you command your troops from a spot that you picked. You can't get out in a hole. You can't, uh, so many things that you can't do. So uh, you've got to be looking for a good place. And... Uh, Shoot. Had my Jeep and, and we were checking out the area. And, uh, we got to, <clears throat> we got to a highway and called back and, uh, told them that, uh, of course, we're, we're using, uh, our code words all the time. Uh, tell them where we're located. And they said, you can't be there. I said, well, yes. Uh, here's the highway and so on. And <coughs> they said, what point are you at? And we told them uh, what point we were from the codes on the map. And uh, they said, well, uh, I want you to shoot the azimuths to these locations. So they gave me three, three points. To triangulate. And, uh, so, uh, they said, you're too far out. Did you get back? He said, you're outside of the, uh, of the beachhead. And, uh, said, it's not even secure. And you're out there. So, so, how many people were with you uh, when you were out doing this? Uh, at that time, uh, <clears throat> there was uh, there was five of us in your unit. Yeah, or my my section. So they were they were out in this area beyond the beachhead. Yeah. Were you the leader as the? Uh, Just my platoon. Looking for a place for... Right. So they said, come on back. So we went back. Uh, did you go on foot or did you have a vehicle? I had a vehicle. Uh, we went back and uh, we didn't go all the way back in <coughs> to, uh, to the headquarters because we found a good location uh with the devil aid and uh, a uh, and some ditches that uh, would be ideal if you know it, it beginning to get late and so we stayed all night and uh, that night they blew up my uh, my trailer and had uh, all of our gear, the, uh, our spare batteries, the uh, wire and, uh, stuff that, that we needed to carry with us. And, uh, so, uh. 
Was that the trailer that was with you or the one that was back at the at the This camp? is trailer. Trailer that was with me. So you we were taking you were taking mortar fire during the night or how did it how did it get blown up? One one round came in and got got my trailer. Hmm. Nothing else. A lucky shot? Well I mean they knew they they were they knew you were there. I mean you're well, I, I don't know. But hmm. that happened. So you can't so, really operate without that trailer. As well, far, as far as laying line and all that stuff. Well, I'm not the only one that has a vehicle in them. Okay. And the wire section, they have nothing but wire. My wire is used once we get inside to go from the switchboards to the oh, okay. different telephones. Oh, okay. But anyways, uh, so, uh, then after the next morning, we went back. <clears throat> I had to find another trailer to steal. Uh, and, uh, we managed. <laughs> and, uh, so that we could have. Guys, you know, you're on a beach. And what's there? Uh, if you put in a, a request or tell them you need something, well, the chances of getting it is uh, from slight to none, you know. It's, <laughs> so if you want something, and you know, vehicle same way. If you want a vehicle, uh, if you were quick and smart enough, you could steal one. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> eventually, we. Uh, uh, we got out. We were attacked, uh, 157. Had a lot of people captured on, on one of the, one of their outings and we, we were sitting on the high ground watching, oh, watching it happen. And, uh, but. Were they captured and killed or were they oh, no, taken no, off no, somewhere? No, no, no. They, they were. If you give up, they just trot you off. When I went back for the 50th anniversary of the liberation of Rome, uh, <clears throat> one of the guys that was captured, he went, he and I went back to, uh, Danzio and, uh, uh, Went, uh, went back to where the cave that he was in, uh, and, uh, he needed to get some pictures for a book that he had written. And, uh, uh, it was, it was kind of, kind of amusing. We, uh, They they gave us a a sedan and a driver to drive back, and uh, so uh, the cave wasn't there. The cave was a uh, clay cave, and uh, they mined clay like you mine coal. And had these big, well, <clears throat> in the 50 years, uh, they're doing what they're doing every place else, and that is just take the top off and then just start scooping the, <clears throat> the clay up. Mm-hmm. So there was no, no cave left. No cave left. And we took some pictures and then, uh, uh, I, uh, went back to, uh, <clears throat> the place where, where I was caught out, uh, repairing a, uh, uh, a line 
uh, all the wiremen were gone, and uh, there was a, no runners around, and uh, I was the only one. And uh, so I grabbed the line, and that's the way you check it. You just grab it and start walking with it running through your, your hand. And uh, when I found the brake, why, uh, I started repairing it. And while, uh, while I'm repairing it, uh, there's an underpass, uh, and I fought. I saw something on the other side of the underpass. <coughs> and, uh, so I finished quick with my uh, splice <clears throat> and sure enough there's tank there so uh, I lay down uh, click the uh, put the clicks on on the wire and uh, uh, call back told them I'm, I'm testing the wire and they said they uh let us ring. <clears throat> and I said, let me take the clip off before you do. And so, evidently they, they rung. I waited a while, clipped it back, and uh, they said, it's, it's good. I said, well, I've got some bad news for you. I said, there's tanks on the other side of the railroad tracks. I said, I see them through the, through the overpass and uh, they said uh, which which one well it just so happened uh, there's three uh, over or underpasses over the railroad and they wanted to know which one and I told them and uh He said, you stay there and uh, tell us what. So uh, uh, I directed the fire until uh, until they had pulled, got their tanks out of there and uh, A lot of, a lot of action was happening. And I'm sitting out there hiding like a coward. And, uh, <clears throat> when, uh, when it's all over with, why, well, uh, if you, uh, read a citation on my, uh, Silver Star, it says that I stayed with my radio. I didn't have a radio. I was, had a telephone that I was in the wire. <clears throat> but we uh, going to Rome was uh, when we we got out. That was a another walk in the park. It was basically they, just walk. The, at that the, point, it had been cleared. The way it had been cleared when you got there. <clears throat> well, yeah, the Germans had all pulled mm-hmm. by this time. How were you received by the people of Rome? Oh, big, big goods. Uh, Did uh, you feel like a welcoming or a hero? Uh, oh a yeah. Oh hero? yes, yes. Uh. We pulled outside of Rome, set up a camp, and uh, <clears throat> cleaned our gear and uh, and all. And they came around and told us that uh, the next day that <clears throat> any of the Catholics that wanted to go in to Rome and have an audience with the Pope, there would be transportation so 
the next next morning the guys <coughs> loaded on the truck and went went to the Vatican and uh so uh I told Whitey that uh you know we ought to go in in order to find out what's going on. Nothing happening around here. I said we'll just go in and see Saint Peter's and and the Vatican. So we drove in <coughs> and uh uh why he put it turned his wheels and uh put a chain on the steering gear steering wheel and uh chained it <coughs> uh took the distributor off and uh these are the things to make sure your Jeep doesn't get stolen? That's the thing. Wow. And you and you do things that uh if you just take the distributor out, uh, they'll still take and push it. But if you turn your wheels, <laughs> you, you know, by this time, <laughs> so we went, <clears throat> we went in, and right after we got there, whether there was a uh, uh, <clears throat> an American priest that was greeted us and uh, wanted to know where we were from and and all and uh, he was part of the church there and wanted to know if. Uh, he could show us around. Well, boy, yeah, you know, great. So we walked through, looking at everything in St. Peter's, and he's pointing out what this is and what that is, and this painting is, and so on. And uh, he said, uh, "Would you like to see the uh, this?" Statues on the roof. Statues on the roof? Never heard of that. Yeah. So, we went up on the roof. When you look at St. Peter's, there's all of these statues. They're big. They're well done. And they're all up, up there. And I'm amazed at what all well. <clears throat> he said, you know, he said, if we're going to hear the Pope, he said, we've got to go. Okay. So we followed him <clears throat> and took us up. And he Opened the door, and when he opened the door, here are all these soldiers in there sitting on the floor. Okay, so we go in. Just a little bit later, the Pope comes in, and uh, tells uh, tells the soldier. How proud they are that they're there. They appreciate what they've done and, and all. And, uh, blessed the group and told us <clears throat> that, uh, as you leave, that, uh, I have a gift for you. And, uh, so, uh, Of course, by this time, everyone's standing. No one's sitting down. They're, they all just standing there. And uh, so uh, the guards come in. Well, 
they're already there, but more come in, they uh, usher Pope Pius. Hmm. And uh, so when we left, we got uh, a rosary that was blessed by the Pope hmm. and uh, and his picture. Hmm. Which is on my wall upstairs. Hmm. Uh, when I got back, <clears throat> I told uh, uh, Mary Snyder, <clears throat> who uh, lived right right behind us, <clears throat> very devout Catholics. Back then, there was only about a half a dozen Catholic families in in Edmond. Wow. And uh, <clears throat> so, of course, Mary came over to see us. And uh, I told her I had something that uh, uh, she might appreciate. So I showed her my, my rosary. And uh, I said, uh, this is the one that the Pope blessed. Man, I I thought she was going to go in. <laughs> and uh, could she hold it? Yeah. Here. <clears throat> well, uh, I had uh, two families that uh, invited me to their home to to tell about meeting the folks. And uh, so, uh, <clears throat> that probably was one of the highlights, positive highlights, I would guess, of your time in Europe. Would Would you say that? Oh uh, no, 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 no. 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 Hmm. But anyway, <clears throat> I got. Uh, <clears throat> I gave. <clears throat> I gave the rosary to uh, Mary. And told her that uh, she might like to have have it, right. and uh, <clears throat> just before she died, she sent it back to me. Mm. So I have it, and uh, from all the ones that <clears throat> that I saw or have seen. Uh, it's not very spectacular. Yeah. Can it? But from a Catholic standpoint, the Pope blessed that. So, but then we pulled out <coughs> of there and uh, we uh, we went to uh, southern France and made the uh, invasion at Southern France. Okay. And uh, was it simultaneous with oh, no, Normandy no, and no, stuff? No, no, It was before well, that. They see, <clears throat> the, they landed in uh, France. The day that Rome fell. The day was when Rome fell. Right. Oh, okay. And uh, when people talk about. Uh, <clears throat> the fight in or the war in Europe. Right. They think of D-Day. Yeah, they don't think about Italy and all the. We've been fighting for a year. That's right. Yeah. And <clears throat> when where we landed, there was a uh, big uh, gun emplacement with nobody around it. Hmm. They had, they had left that. And they had left. And uh, by <clears throat> by this time, gosh, I don't know how much time had passed, but 
they were beginning to to move and uh, then we fell we fell in line and started uh, uh, <coughs> Nuremberg uh, oh gosh what were those towns anyway did you drive all I mean you, you landed in southern France and then started to make for Germany I mean was that yes and uh, how far did you all get did you go to Germany yes we our final objective was uh <clears throat> oh, uh, uh, Nuremberg. Huh. And see, that, uh, death camp. I was going to ask if there were any death camps. That uh, you... death camp, uh, death camp. Uh, the cow was just out of Nuremberg. Did you go to Dachau? Yes. Really? And, uh, the people, <clears throat> the people there, I said Nuremberg, Munich, we were in Munich. Okay. That's our final destination. That's okay. where we wound up. Okay. And, uh, Nuremberg is one of the places. But, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the, the people of Munich, we told them about the oh uh Dachau. Dachau. There's not such a place out there. They loaded them up and took them out. When uh when I went out <coughs> uh oh we didn't get in. Nobody got in. The 157th had liberated it, but by the time they got the people, man, it was completely closed off. Uh, the medics and all that was coming in, uh, <clears throat> they didn't, they didn't release them. Uh, they, <clears throat> they got, uh, German citizens in to start cleaning it up. Uh, burying the, the, uh, <clears throat> uh, oh, uh, 100, <clears throat> when the division, took it, uh, they were still burning bodies. Dead bodies stacked. And uh, this, uh, we could see through the, through the wire. And we walked around and, but like I say, they wasn't letting anybody in. Didn't make any difference. What? Uh. Did you all, did we know about the existence of death camps? Did the army know that you would be encountering that when you went into Germany? Or was that a surprise? Uh, they knew it, but they didn't know at what extent. I'm sure that. I didn't know anything about them. Mm. What, fact, were, what were you first told, or what do you remember about when you learned what was going on? What? Uh, what how, how, did, how did you hear about it, or what did you, what, oh, what was said? Uh, Right after we moved in, uh, <clears throat> we were told while we were moving uh, that uh, by this time, Pat was back in the, in the fight. And was he back with your unit? Or no, was no, 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 no. He never came back to your no, unit? No, no, no. Of course, he never was part of the unit. Well. We were part of his army. That's right. <laughs> but he now had the uh, didn't he have a third third army I, don't know. I, think so. I think that's it okay and uh, he was 
man running them up. I mean, he's driving, he's running out of gas. And everyone was talking about they can't keep gas with Patton. And of course, you know, uh, they talk about uh, Patton <coughs> uh, liberated uh, the bulge. Uh, that's not exactly right. Uh, but Patton did. Uh, they were trying to figure out what they were going to do. And uh, Eisenhower had had his big meeting. And uh, they were talking about uh, the relief of the bulls and uh, Patton said that uh, they're talking how many days it was going to take to break someone loose and uh, he said he could make it in three days and everyone was making fun of the fact that there was no way that uh, he could uh, he could do it well <coughs> uh, he uh, he had already told uh, his troops and this is this hearsay mm-hmm. uh, they the people that should know say, say that he had already told his troops get ready and start moving because we're going to go we're the the ones and then he in the meeting he said I can do it well the only thing is <clears throat> one of the biggest difficulties they had they couldn't get any supplies they couldn't get anything because of the overcast mm. the planes weren't flying they but the sun came out the day before Patton got there and just as soon as the sun came out the planes began to fly and uh, drop supplies and also did some strafing and so on but Patton still gets the credit for being part of the liberation of Uh, <clears throat> there's see the regular army uh, they're a close knit group these damn civilian soldiers like the 45th and all the 10th army I mean the 10th division the uh, mountain division they call them their objective was uh, <coughs> to uh, take the cow. They were the liberators. Mm-hmm. Uh, the colonel had already taken it. And when the general came and <coughs> told him that uh, that was his objective and that they would take charge, he ran him off. And, of course, uh, I think that that's part of the story at the museum, Mm -hmm. is uh, that commander telling about his uh, taking of, Mm -hmm. and uh, have, have you seen that room by any chance? I don't, I've been in the museum, but I don't remember... That there is a room. So. There is a room. And that's all that's in it. Is the photographs and all. Unless when they redid the museum. Are you talking about downtown, the museum? Or the art armory here? No, the, the big... No, I haven't. I need to go there. Can you believe that? I'm sorry. I need to you go. have not been to the 45th Division Museum. No, I have not. I oh, don't. my gosh. We're going to remedy that. <laughs> the... Uh, 
<coughs> well, one of the things that you'll see is a <coughs> huge picture, a blow up of a picture of a soldier lying in uh, Hitler's bed. Uh, reading a copy of Montauk. Hmm. That's my brother. Oh, really? Wow. And that's in the museum down there. Wow. So, so did both of your brothers that were in the division survive the war? Uh, my, uh, my, uh, Older brother and I were stayed with him. ML, the uh, middle brother, middle brother from Art McCreamian. Uh, <clears throat> they pulled him out. He was a steam fitter, and uh, he went to work. Uh, uh, Building uh, steamships. Hmm. So uh, he spent all of his time uh, building ships until stateside. Mm-hmm. Until it was over. With. Did your older brother make it through the war? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then my little brother, he joined us in in Germany. Join the unit? Yep. Wow. Uh, and did he, make it, did he make it as well? Yeah. Wow. And uh, when <clears throat> when he, uh, just as soon as he got out of high school, he joined the, the Army. And they sent him over as a replacement. And uh, we had... <clears throat> Trying to think where we were when he he joined us, but anyway, uh, <coughs> uh, my brother found out that, or my mother had written and uh, said he he had gone to Germany, so <coughs> he was in. He was the mess sergeant for regimental headquarters. So, he knew everybody, had all kinds of contacts, so he got to check and work. If they had any idea where little brother is, and found out that he was in the replacement center, uh, not too far away, so <clears throat> he got in the jeep and went to, uh, visit him, and, uh, uh, Found out where he was and all, and uh, uh, told him, said, uh, "Want you in in the unit?" Said, "I'll go make make the arrangement." So he went back and told the commander that he wanted uh, a little brother, and they said, "Fine." Said, "We'll we'll start the start the paperwork," and said, "Up, get me." <coughs> and uh, Hi. Let me call you back. Uh, <clears throat> when, uh, then he went back the next day and, uh, to tell him that, uh, oh, uh, they were working on paperwork to get him. And, uh, my little brother said, uh, well, we're moving out this afternoon. He said, what's your job? And he says, I'm B.A. Army. What does that mean? Running automatics. That's the uh, the automatic rifle. At, uh, well, he's a maintenance guy for those rifles then? Or? Oh, no. He, he was an he was infantryman. Really. He was an infantryman. Uh, B.A. Army don't last very long. Mm. 
because of the amount of ammunition that they're firing, they they get spotted and fired on. It's you know mm-hmm. one of those things. But anyway, and when he told him, he said, uh, <clears throat> "I'm a BAR man." He said, "No, you're not. Get your bag and get in the jeep." So he took him back. He was actually AWOL. Mm-hmm. But they picked him up and uh, he became uh, the assistant supply sergeant. Wow. And uh, worked in the supply room. Mm-hmm. And uh, of course very short time we're we're out of the war because we're uh, <clears throat> we're in uh, Munich uh, the uh, the Russians had already made contact in a short time the war's over and uh, just before the war's over, <clears throat> why uh, I was called into uh, Colonel Cotton Smith. <clears throat> he was battalion commander. Uh, he called. There was six of us, six sergeants, that uh, was called up battalion headquarters, and. Uh, Got there and here these five other sergeants are and start asking, what you do? You know, why would the colonel be calling this up here? Yeah. And we'd been into trouble, not caught, but we'd been doing things we shouldn't have, <laughs> I, you know. But, uh, <clears throat> finally, uh, he came through. And uh, his <clears throat> his office is one of the big house uh, or the big buildings just off of King's Plaza, uh-huh. and uh, they're two of the landmark Nazi buildings, huh. and uh, beautiful. Terraza floors, winding staircase going up to the second floor, and all. <clears throat> and uh, so we're waiting, and he passes. He comes in, passes right by us, and uh, of course we're all saluted. He threw off one of his salutes and just kept going, and we all knew we were in trouble. And, uh. What have you been doing? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I, like to say, uh, we'd, we'd taken some of the money that we'd, uh, we'd gotten from some of the banks that, uh, going through, you know, and we had sorted out and found out what, what was good and what people were taking. And uh, going to the farms and buying things, you know. Uh, but anyway, uh, <clears throat> finally the sergeant major came out and said, uh, Colonel, see you now. We walked in, stood in front of his desk. And, uh, he sat there and stirred at it uh, for a while and... Uh, Every, if everyone was like me, I was really scared that there must be something that he found out about that uh, I don't know what could have happened. You know, it just so finally he got up from his <coughs> desk, came around and started down the line and said, well, I want to be first to congratulate you, second damn lieutenants. Whew, great, you know. So, <clears throat> he dismissed us. 
And uh, so you were at commission then. I mean, that was. I was at that point. You're a second damn lieutenant. Okay. <laughs> so we get outside and we start talking to one another. You know what's this mean? I already know that if you're ever promoted, that you can't be in the unit. When you're promoted, you have to go to another unit. Oh. And, uh, I don't know what this means on the point system. Mm. I've got enough points to go home. I've been here for forever. Mm. So I get on the telephone and I call my brother. I told him what happened. <clears throat> and he cussed a little bit and said, uh, you're not going to be an officer. And I said, uh, well, I, I don't know. And he said, well, just a bit. So I wait around and he called me back and he said, uh, little brother, how long will it take you to get your duffel bag? And I said, why? And he said, you and I are going home. So, I got my duffel bag, got my driver, and he took me over to headquarters. And when I got to headquarters, why, they're real happy to see me. I said, uh, Lieutenant, you've got an oath of office to sign. And I said, uh, well, I'm on my way home. And they said, well, uh, you've got an office. You've got an oath to sign. And I said, I'm not going to sign it. So we go to division headquarters. And when we get to division headquarters, why... Well, Troops from different places are coming together, and uh, we get uh, get to the point that uh, we're going home. And uh, they call me in and said, uh, "Look at over your records. And there is an oath here that has not been signed." I said, I'm not signing that oath. Said, okay. Put it in the packet. Next morning, uh, we, uh, take a plane to, uh, North Africa. And when we get to North Africa, uh, we board a, uh, B-17. And there's three B-17s flying back with troops in. And uh, flew back to uh, flew into Florida and uh, took a train from uh, Florida to Arkansas. Mm. And uh, in uh, Florida, they pointed out I had not signed my post office. I get to uh, Arkansas, Camp Gruber, and uh, start through the processing. And same thing. Said, uh, and he kept calling me lieutenant. You haven't signed your own. I said I'm not going to. And you're still wearing your your sergeant. Well, sure. Yeah. I'm insignia. Your your sergeant. So they discharged me, and I come home. I'm discharged. I uh, <clears throat> I get back in June. Have to make up my mind what I'm going to do. I'm going to 
GED and go to college or am I going to finish up my high school? And I thought, well, I've lost a lot. I just go back to school. So I went <coughs> up to high school and asked them what I had to do to get my degree. And they said, well, you got to enroll. So I enrolled. Went to uh, high school and uh, uh, <clears throat> was uh, a senior in high school. The class elected me as president of the class. I uh, couldn't play football, so I told him that. Uh, I like to assist the coach and uh, they told me that uh, they were sure that Bobby Van Antwerp would love to have me as uh, assistant coach but before school started I got a telephone call that Bobby is not back we need you to go issue out the uniforms to the to the team said okay Raiders We'll meet you at the gym. So I went up to the gym. The boys were there, and they were already picking out their uniforms, the one they had last year, and the new one was picking up what was left. They were in terrible shape. Uh, so uh, the... Uh, <coughs> superintendent uh, met me and said this is what Bob would like for you to work on here are five plays a pass pattern and a punt formation that we want you to work on with the boys and I said okay I said I don't know anything about T formation but I can sure get them in shape and we went to work and uh, shoot I'm an army sergeant that dealt with with men and I can order around and I can take these kids and put them in shape which I did uh, I tried to play defense and <clears throat> in the uh, in the army on the team the only thing I could do was make the basketball team I was one of the basketball players uh, <clears throat> and I had my jacket that was stolen from me and it eventually came back to me but anyway so I'm working on the kids and we uh, we play our first game and I'm the coach no Bob we played Guthrie and I gave the ball game away uh, one of the kids got hurt and I ran out on the field the referee caught me before I got there stuck his finger in my face and says coach you know better than to be out on this field one yard for every step it takes you to get back on that damn bench I took big steps and I got over it and watched as they got the kid up got him to the sideline and all back then the coach was not allowed to be on the field. If he sent a play in, that player that was substituted could not be in the uh, huddle until the next play. Hmm. Uh, if uh, all kinds of crazy things happened on on the field, we did. We had hideouts. We had the water boy play. We had all of this stuff that 
is crazy, but but you couldn't be on the field. You you talked. Uh, you had a skull session on a Thursday night and told the players everything that they were going to do the next day. And if and the quarterback ran the team. Wow. Now then, everybody from the lowest kid to the professionals, they do exactly what the coach tells them to do. Back then, it was a game that the kids played. Well, got your score. Six to nothing ball game. Mm-hmm. Next week, we work real hard and uh, go to Kingfisher. We play Kingfisher. Nothing to nothing. Hi. I had a good defense. Proud of. But uh, after that game, the next Monday, I was in the superintendent's office to tell him that I had to get somebody else because evidently I wasn't doing anything right because I didn't know what else to do with that T formation except those plays and those plays weren't working. And uh, <clears throat> I was there the, before he got there and when he came in why uh, as he was going to his office he saw me and uh, uh, said or him glad to see you. need to talk to you. And, uh, so, I went in to tell him that he's going to have to get somebody else. And before I had a chance to tell him anything, why he said, uh, school board had a meeting Saturday after your game. Said they like the way you handle the boys. Said they want you to be the head football coach at Edmond High School football team. And I said, uh, I can do anything I want. Said it's your ball club. I spent time with, uh, E.C. Hafer at Kirkland Drugstore drawing plays on napkins, uh, and uh, getting work in the single wing that I knew something about. We played Foster High School. 56 to nothing. Uh, <clears throat> came back and... Uh, Go to class, real proud of what happened. And you're attending class at this point. Oh, I'm, I'm a senior in high school. I'm sitting, I'm sitting in the classroom with the kids that are on my football team. So, I, uh, <coughs> uh, oh, uh, I'm called out of class. Superintendent wants to see you. So I went over. I'm all excited, you know. Won a ball game. Went in and thinking, boy howdy, going to get patted on the back. <clears throat> he said, uh, Orly, we don't beat teams like that. And I said, everybody played. He said, we don't beat teams like that. And I said, uh, well, Sipes played almost half the game. That's my backup quarterback. Uh, 
I don't know if he is a sophomore or a freshman that year, but anyway. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, he reminded me three times that we just don't beat teams like that. And uh, I told the kids we're having fun. He said, I'm sure they were. <laughs> So, <clears throat> let's see. What'd you tell what? the team then? What? What'd you tell the team then? What What were they supposed to do in that situation? I, I didn't say a thing to the team. Huh. Because, <clears throat> uh, oh gosh, why did you name that school? Uh, Broom Corps. Broom Corn Center uh, down by Falls Valley. Uh, anyway, we played them, and that's the one where <clears throat> we kicked the ball back to them on the kickoff. Uh, because Hafer said that if you get the ball and you don't run with it, you can kick it. And kick it right back to them, put them on the defense. And that's what I had. I was a defensive team. Right. No one was scoring on me yet. Right. So, uh, we played the first half and, uh, so, uh, when we, at the halftime, I told them. Purcell? Was it Purcell? That, what? Purcell? Is that what it was? Not no. no. But anyway. And <clears throat> we... Uh, so you kicked the ball Mark, back at them what? so that you could be on defense? Yeah. So, I told them, I said, it doesn't make any difference who gets the ball. Don't run with it. Just take and kick it. Well, <clears throat> I had one of the best punters in the world. Uh, High school ball. Uh, playing uh, in the conference. And I was in hopes that uh, he would he'd get the ball. But who gets the ball? The Lowell Thompson, the quarterback. And he's... Uh, <clears throat> he couldn't kick a ball. <laughs> and I'm... Well, I screwed up. Well, he kicked. It didn't make any difference. Because when he kicked the ball, everybody on the opposing team stopped. And watch that ball. And, of course, we're charging down. And uh, we're... They put them in a hole, and we had people talking about that for a long time. <laughs> but it was things like that that we did. Uh, but we beat them, and our next team was, uh, was uh, Midwest City. And they were going to be the conference champions. They had a passer, and... Uh, he was good, and so, of course, we already knew about this because everyone was talking about how good uh, they were and uh, how good this passer is, <clears throat> and uh, I'm having all kinds of trouble with names. Sheldon. Uh, Sheldon was uh, one of my tackles. And he was good. And uh, he, he said, uh, Coach said uh, that Coker will not complete a pass. You know, I was a quarterback for Midwest City. That was a quarterback, Midwest City. And, uh, 
the kids <coughs> had uh, worked on something that I didn't know about. But uh, the uh, the guard did not take care of his man. And he did, didn't let him... <clears throat> the only thing he was interested in was taking the, the man in front of Sheldon and jerking him. Which gave Sheldon enough opening that he was wide open going in after that quarterback. Mm-hmm. And he ate his lunch. Mm-hmm. I tell you. <laughs> They didn't score on us. We scored on them. Wow. We didn't lose another ball game until we played Putnam City in the final ball game. Mm. For the championship? What? Was it for the championship or was that yeah. for the conference game? Right. It's conference. <clears throat> they didn't have state champions. Mm. You won your conference. That's the big deal. Okay. And, uh, so, I had a, had a winning season. What an amazing year that was. And then you graduated after that year? I graduated, went to Central. While I was at Central, I, uh, organized the first, oh, uh, junior high basketball team. Because... They only had one gym, Jefferson Hall. Good be our guy. Uh, named after uh, <coughs> my uh, grandmother's brother. <coughs> and you'll see that on <coughs> But that's the only gym besides the uh, college. Okay. <coughs> so when I propose that uh, we start a basketball program for the junior high, They said, where are you going to practice? And I said, well, I'd like to use the gym. I said, well, it's only available first thing in the morning. And I said, okay, we'll practice in the morning before school. And they said, you're not going to get any kids up here to practice. And I said, I think we will. I organized... <coughs> Uh, a basketball team. Uh, did real well <clears throat> our first year. Uh, and in our second year, <clears throat> we won the uh, <clears throat> County tournament. And this isn't you, is it? What? That's not you. That's me. This is you on the right? That's me. Wow. And you saw me in my uniform, my football uniform. That's the invitation I did, yeah. Okay. Is that your senior year? That's when my, was, when that's, was that? My, that's my senior year. That's your senior year. Okay. And this is two years later. Okay. And so you all, did you say you won the championship the second year? Yes. Wow. The county tournament was the, <coughs> uh, was the ultimate. Mm-hmm. Wait, and so this would have been, what, 47, uh, 48? Uh, when, when did that, you come back from the war? That's 40, 40, 45. So. Uh, that picture was 48. 48? <coughs> 
when those boys got into high school, they <clears throat> they had the uh, intramural tournament where the seniors play the sophomores and the juniors play the freshmen, and that makes the juniors and the seniors in the playoffs. Right. Didn't work. When <clears throat> the juniors played the freshmen, freshmen beat them. <laughs> I put them <clears throat> in the tournament with seniors. And they beat the seniors. Wow. Uh, Steve Shepard. Did you know Steve? He's a member of the church. <clears throat> Steve was uh, the basketball coach. Uh, he uh, <clears throat> told people that I sent him the best basketball team that he ever worked with, <laughs> and he got me a <clears throat> he got me a job as uh, as a coach, which I didn't take later on. You, so might want, were you, you might want to turn that off. Oh, okay, no So you coached football your senior year? Yes. And then you you ended up later being offered a basketball job. What what did you end up were you a teacher then after that? Well <clears throat> Well while I was in college, I uh <clears throat> oh uh, uh after school I uh I worked out <clears throat> I uh had the job of uh, veterinary manager at the Chamber of Commerce. And it was <clears throat> uh, a uh, three-hour a day, day job. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, I... Uh, Got back in the National Guard. And, uh, then, uh, <clears throat> I. Did they make you lieutenant? Just, I had just, <laughs> uh, graduated, graduated in 1950. And, uh, they, uh, <clears throat> called the National Guard up again to go to Korea. Well, in the meantime, I went to the military department <clears throat> and uh, to get back in the guard and asked him what I had to do. And uh, they said, uh, you're already a lieutenant. All you have to do is sign the oath of office. So uh, I went to Korea as first lieutenant. And, uh, of course, Lieutenant, doing almost the same job that I was doing in World War II, <clears throat> I was a 
they had changed the name from uh, communications to signal. So I was a signal officer. And uh, So you basically took enough time to coach your high school ball, go to college, and then Korea. Yeah. Wow. So from uh, 45 to uh, 50, yeah. I finished school. And, uh, of course, there was a period in there where... <coughs> uh, uh, I'd done all kinds of odd jobs. When you went to Korea... But, then see, I wasn't... I'm, I'm not married yet. No. I'm still single. That's right. I didn't get married until uh, 52. Were you in Korea a year then, or how long were you in Korea? I was in Korea two years. Well, I was in Japan and Korea. At what point did you enter the Korean War? I mean, what was happening? Had, cause I, and my Korean War history is not great, but I know at one point we got pushed all the way down to the bottom, the Incheon, and then we pushed all the way back. Right. You know, and, and then and we, we got back to the we got. <clears throat> we were not going to go to, <clears throat> we weren't going to Korea. We went to occupy, uh, the camp in Japan or in Hokkaido, Japan. Okay. That's the island. Uh, of the, North, the Northern Island? R- right. Yeah. And so we were there. The first cab lost their colors. Which means they were captured? No. What that it mean? means when you lose your colors, you've you've lost uh, control, and they pulled them out, <clears throat> and they came back to Japan, and we took their place in Korea. Was that when we got pushed all the way down to the, uh, end of the no? <clears throat> we got there as they were being pushed back up. So did and your unit cross the 38th parallel and push into North North Korea, or what did your unit? You know, uh, we didn't go beyond it. <coughs> uh, see, <coughs> the parallel was <coughs> was maintained as the dividing line. Right. And uh, I came. <coughs> came back and uh, all of the National Guard <coughs> troops that went over, most of them <coughs> had come home. Mm. And uh, then they had a big ceremony and uh, oh, uh, <coughs> brought the colors back and uh, set up the National Guard again. Uh, Was it pretty cold over there? Oh, gosh, it's just cold. Miserable. With all the snow and everything we had in <coughs> uh, Pine Camp, wasn't near as bad as the cold over there. Mm. It was a miserable cut in type of cold. That and were you involved in fighting over there or were you all oh, yes, in the reserves? Yes, yes. We took over a division's front line positions. Uh, that had basically been killed? I mean, that division had been decimated? No. No. I don't, I'm still not sure I understand what you mean when, they're, when they lose their colors. Do you mean that the enemy captures their commandos? No, no. It means, <coughs> it means that they have lost the ability and desire to fight. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. And you're not going to find much of this in history. But that's exactly what happened. Wow. So did those soldiers 
baskets. They they left uh, a number of them to fill our ranks. Was the worst bunch of people you ever saw. Regular and army. The, or regular army, and they went on back to. And of course, all of these are draftees. Oh right, yeah, that's what I was thinking that they would be. Wow. And their attitudes and and so on. <coughs> uh, evidently, the officers had no control over them, and they thought they knew all the tricks. <coughs> and so you all had to deal with them. To join your group, but a big percent of our people, all of our uh, <coughs> staff officers, and all were World War II veterans, had, uh, for instance, you rotate on guard duty, you know, so it was time for one of the guys to go on. Guard duty, and uh, it only been on a <coughs> short time, and uh, he fired his rifle. Of course, scares the hell out of people. You don't know what's going on. The, what's he shooting at, and all, and so uh, a. <coughs> hey, uh, Go out to the guard post. And, uh, and these are walking posts. In other words, this is not a person in a place. You've got so much ground to cover, mm-hmm. and that's the reason you're out there. You're walking your post, and uh, <clears throat> so uh, immediately put another person out. And uh, when he came in, uh, why uh, I asked what it what was well it was just it was just next an and uh, so. <coughs> I said, uh, he's going to walk the post. Uh, he's not going to carry a rifle, but he's going to walk the post. And uh, he said, uh, you can't do that to me. I said, what? What am I doing to you? He said, Making me walk post. I said, weren't you walking a post? Yes, sir. Okay, you're walking a post. Go out and walk the post. So, sergeant took him out and he walked the post. So, <clears throat> time change. Change your four hours. When they made change, why, uh, they come in, go through the procedures of passing on the orders and so on. And, uh, the person that went out to do the relief started off. The other kids started with him. I said, hey, where are you going? I'm going to bed. I said, you can't go to bed. You're going to go help the guy that uh, just left because he doesn't know what's going on and you need to be with him. And I get this, you can't do this to me. And I says, I can't? He said, no. He said, I know my rights. And I said, what are your rights? 
And he stumbled and him hauled around. And uh, I said, you're looking at Lieutenant Peters. And I'm the duty officer. You're here to walk guard. You're going to walk with him. So he walked his tour. Turned out for a nice kid. I'm <laughs> straight down. All right. Well, uh, thank you for taking so much time to share a lot. Well, I told, I, I told you more than you wanted to know. No, you actually <laughs> didn't. You actually didn't. And there's some remarkable things in there that I had not... I knew a little bit about you being in Italy because I'd heard you tell a story or two at men's group about probably Salerno, but I definitely didn't know as much about that whole episode, so. Uh, <coughs> when, uh, <coughs> when I retired, uh, Lucille and I, uh, in fact, just a short time after my retirement, <coughs> uh, she and I, uh, went to Hawaii. And, uh, <coughs> took the ship around the island, mm-hmm. stopping at all of them. Right. And, uh, man, that really, I, I really like that. And, uh, then, uh, I took a, uh, <coughs> uh, she and I took a, a trip to, uh, oh, uh, England. And, uh, uh, I visited, uh, yeah, well, well, we went for the uh, Wood Badge reunion <coughs> in Gilwell. So, uh, of course, we we traveled by bus from place to place uh, and wound up <coughs> uh, in London, and then from London. Uh, we took took the uh, train out to to Gilwell, which is when you get to Gilwell, you're up on a mountain and you're looking down into the town of London or, mm. or the Valley. the city of London. <clears throat> but uh, then, uh, and I told her, you know that. Uh, they had uh, had the float trips, and uh, so uh, we went to uh, Egypt and uh, uh, floated. No, we went to uh, Europe and floated uh, the Rhine. And, uh, I got hooked because, man, we, you go on, put your, hang your clothes up, and you float down and see the scenery, and you pull into a, a, a harbor or to a, a place where you get off, and you see the things that are going on there. <coughs> uh, we did that, uh, the Rhine, the Yangtze, the, oh, uh, oh, uh, Russia, Japan, uh, all, all the major waterways and my wife, <clears throat> has books 
where uh, she she wrote, I took pictures. Yeah. And then she put it all together, and they're in folders up. Did you all visit Pearl Harbor when you were in Hawaii? Oh yes, yes. So that's one of the one of the stop, one of the major places. Well, then of course uh, <coughs> we flew over. Uh, we flew a uh, refueling plane from Altus to uh, to Hawaii and uh, stayed uh, five days at uh, the uh, Alcoa. Uh-huh, yeah. That's uh, beautiful. Did you retire from the Guard then? Were you, uh, did you stay as a career in the Guard or after Korea did you, did you get out? I stayed, well, that's where the uh, foot, uh, basketball uh, <clears throat> I was I was working on my master's degree at uh, at OU and uh, coming home and uh, working for Fred Schneider as a as an electrician hmm. and uh, <clears throat> wasn't making too much money uh, and uh <clears throat> oh, uh, the uh, superintendent from uh, Texoma came and understood that uh, I was looking for a job, and I was uh, looking for a basketball job. Uh, well, I really wasn't, but uh, I was looking for any kind of job. And he said that uh, <clears throat> Steve Shepard had sent me and told me if I wanted boys to learn basketball, uh, that I would be their their man. And he said uh, uh, he had nothing but praises for you, mm-hmm. and said we're looking for a basketball coach. Mm-hmm. Said of course. We'll have uh, a couple of classes to teach, and uh, that we'll work that out. So I went up to Texoma and uh, looked over the situation, met the school board and some of the people of the community, and uh, um, that was... July yeah late late July and uh, so the job with with Fred <coughs> was okay but uh, I talked to uh, one of my friends he was the uh, operations officer in, in Korea, and I was the signal officer, and we were working together. And so I met him, and he wanted to know what I was doing, and I told him. And I said, I've got to find a job. I said, I'm married, and uh, got a son, need uh and he'd start making some money. And he said, uh, well, uh, why don't you go talk to Colonel Ruth? He said, uh, he hires people on a part-time basis down at the military department. And uh, so I dressed up, went down to see Colonel Ruth. Uh, I knew him. Uh, had Worked with him some in scouting and, uh, uh, being in the National Guard, everyone knew that USPFO. <clears throat> so I went in and 
told him I was uh, looking for a, for a job. And Bill had already told him that I was coming down. Mm-hmm. So uh, <clears throat> he said, uh, all right, he said, uh, go uh, go over to the warehouse and report to McCarthy. And I said, well, I'll go home and change clothes. And he said, you came down work, didn't you? I said, <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> and he said, uh, <clears throat> McConaughey will take care of you. And so I went, went over and he went back to the closet and threw out some fatigues for me and said, we're building shelves. And we were putting steel shelves together. Huh. And, uh, I worked, came home, told my wife that working for working for him, and uh, I worked in the warehouse. And they took inventory, and <clears throat> uh, put two uh, two cards in every. Every stack or every bin or whatever. And, uh, you'd take one, count it, and, uh, turn it in, and, uh, someone else come along and do the same thing. Then they'd compare the cards, see if they were the same. Mm-hmm. Then give them to the poster, and, uh, back then they were using, uh, <coughs> the big, uh, oh, uh, what was in the cards? Anyway, it, it was, uh, the same, same things that the banks were using in that <clears throat> if you had an account, you had a card. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so, uh, I got through with the counting part, so I went back to help them. And they were stamping the cards with a, the with a stamp inventory and then writing in what the count was. And <clears throat> if, uh, if there was, was a difference in what was on the stock record card, then you had to make an adjustment. So I asked why they were stamping the cards. And they said, well, that's the inventory. Or for the inventory. And I said, well, the machine will do that. And uh, so... I took a card and showed him. Well, the person in charge, his name was uh, Shrum. And Shrum said, uh, that's the, not the way we do it. You stamp them and put the number. All right. So I did that and then I got to thinking. You know, I can sit here and stamp all of these, then go back and start entering the numbers. And if I slow down and don't do very many of these, it's almost quitting time anyway. And this is Friday. And tomorrow, I can come down here when just the colonel and two or three people that he's asked to stay, and I can post those things. By, so, by using the machine? What? By using the machine. Well, shoot, yes. About three, pull that thing, and you're through. Put another one in. So, I did it. And I posted all of the cards. And went home real proud of myself and uh, said... When, 
<coughs> oh, uh, on Monday, when I went back to work, why, uh, I went in and, uh, I was standing around waiting to see what, what comes up next. I've, I've counted, uh, the shells are completed and, uh, the posting is all done and I'm just waiting for my next order. Go do this. And, uh, Trump comes in and says, uh, you gotta get those cards, uh, stamped. And I said, they're all stamped. What do you mean they're stamped? I said, I, I took care of that Saturday. And he came over and picked up the cards. Oh, he was mad. And he was raising hell and going on. And what was I doing when he had told me that I had to stamp the card? Well, this only went on for a very few seconds because Colonel Ruth walked in about that time. And he says, what's the problem? And, uh, Trump said, uh, Peter didn't, uh, stamp the cards and so he got them all in the tub. Well, of course, as I was doing it, I was putting them where they're supposed to be. And the colonel walked over and pulled one of them up and looked at it and said, how did you do this? And I said, the Burroughs machine does it. And he said, uh, well, how? And I said, I showed him, you know, here's the procedure. He said, can you show the rest of the stock record people how to do this? And I said, yes, sir. So, a little later, I have them all gathered around, and I'm taking blank cards and putting them in and showing them that if you have a balance and you punch this just like you've been doing to take out, put back in, now it's time to find your inventory. Then you put in what you counted and you hit this button that says inventory and pull the button, pull the lever. Hey, you know, great. A little bit later, uh, Ruth comes in and says, uh, what are you going to do? And I said, what? And he said, are you going to go to school? Are you going to go teach school? Or are you going to work for me? And, uh, well, I've got a job. And, uh, before I could answer him, he said, if you'll go to work for me, I'll take care of you. I like those words. Mm -hmm. And I said, uh, I'll work for you. I came home and got got on the telephone and uh, called Texoma and apologized. I'm not going to be able to make it. I've got a job that's going to pay me more money. going to be a little more secure, I think. So I went for to work for them, and of course, to working for them, you got to be in the National Guard. So I worked for him. Uh, I wound up uh, going over to uh, North Little Rock, Arkansas, 
and worked in the National Guard Profession Education Center mm-hmm. as an instructor mm-hmm. in logistics. Uh, I went over as a guest instructor uh, three times. And the third time I went over, uh, they wanted to know why I didn't apply for for the job. And uh, I said, I didn't know. said, well, we sent notices to all of the USPFOs that this there was an opening over here. And so they gave me an application. I filled it out, of course. It had to be signed. And uh, so I brought it back and asked them why they didn't post the vacancies that that occur over the system. Right. Uh, and uh, so they... They went ahead and signed my release, and I moved over there and worked over there a couple of years as a as an instructor. And uh, my retirement was getting real close, and uh, I was on the uh, rewrite committee. Uh, for the Boy Scouts of America to uh, rewrite the uh, Wood Badge syllabus. And uh, we had completed it, and we were to make our uh, uh, report at the national meeting in Washington, D.C. And uh, so uh, I had told them that I needed three days off to go to Washington and uh, had been given permission. And uh, in the meantime, got a new uh, uh, director of the center. To replace Colonel Root? What? Oh, no, no, no. Oh, you're talking about the Arkansas center. Arkansas. The Arkansas center, yeah. Colonel Root, by the way, had already retired and uh, Wilson had taken his place <clears throat> and uh, but anyway uh, uh, they came to me they came to me and told me that uh, uh, my leave had been cancelled and then I said, I've got to go. I said, uh, I was told I could and I got it all set. And he said, well, gosh, I can't remember his name. Anyway, he said, can't do it. So <clears throat> I said, well, you tell him how important this is to me because uh, this is a, a committee that I've worked on for a long time and I'm going to be there when they make that report. He came back and said, uh, he said, forget it. By this time, I'm getting just a little bit teed, so I, uh, <clears throat> I went up to headquarters. And uh, told uh, or uh, asked him uh, what I would get if I uh, if I retired. And uh, they said, uh, "Well, that." Uh, did work it out. Tell me what what it was. So uh, next day I went over and they had they'd taken all of my time and everything and had figured it out. 
and uh, <clears throat> the difference in what I was making and what my retirement would be was less than twenty dollars. Oh my gosh! I said, I quit. And they said, uh, when uh, when you want this dated? And uh, I said, I'm leaving on Thursday. I think that this this was on Tuesday. Yeah. I said, I'm leaving on Thursday. I'm going to Washington. And uh, I said, okay. So on Wednesday. I went over and signed everything. I, we had Lucille and I moved to Arkansas. So I told uh, Lucille what what I'd done, and uh, she said, uh, "Well, uh, are you going to stay here?" I said, "No, we're going back home." And she said, "Well." While you're gone, I'll start packing. And I said, yeah. So, I got on a phone call a person that we bought the house from. I told him that we rent a house for sale. And uh, I went to Washington, uh, made the meeting. We... Uh, reported on our uh, project and uh, when it got back why uh, Lucille had already shown the house and uh, uh, the person that uh, wanted the house uh, came around and uh, had a counter offer, and uh, I told him no. I said, uh, told him what we had paid for the house, what we had done to the house, and uh, would put in a new air conditioner, and I'd done a lot of work on the place, and. Uh, so I said, uh, it's actually worth more than I'm asking. And uh, he said, uh, you think about it. And uh, had another person come and check with me. I told him. And uh, he said, uh, all right, here's his wife. We'd, uh, we'd think about it. I said, well, I've got somebody else that's thinking about it. And uh, so the guy came came back, and he said, uh, you won't change your mind. I said, no. I said, I've got somebody else looking. Well, he said, yeah. I said, yeah. He said, okay. <laughs> So he, he bought the house, and uh, shoot, short time, uh, we're loaded up in a U-Haul coming back home. So, but over the years, I've had a great time. We didn't even get into a lot of the scouting stuff. No, there's a lot of that. I mean, you did a little bit with the Woodman story uh, as far as the syllabus, but there's lots of scouting stories as well. Well, only 40, I uh, mean 74 years. Yeah, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I better uh, I better go. My wife is probably wondering what we're, what, what's happened. Oh, gosh. I'm sorry. In the interview. Sorry. No, this is no no need for an apology. The The, the, the word is... For me, thank you. Thank you for your time and uh, 
Well, and uh, I will, with your permission, um, not only you know share this audio with you, but a couple of those stories I I would probably like to take out and maybe put some pictures with and uh, share some of those in, in a little bit shorter form. Um, okay, if, if that's all right with you. All right. I'm delighted to get to do this. You know, I don't. I we do these kind of projects a lot, and I've interviewed different people. But uh, I really enjoy being able to hear for so many reasons. You know, there's so many, so many different uh, experiences. I mean, obviously the military stuff is of interest to me, but I've certainly never met anyone that uh, that graduated from high school at the same time they coached the football team. <laughs> Never, uh, never knew that. Well, you know, there's, <clears throat> there's all kinds of, uh, things that, uh, uh, happen that are funny. There's a lot of funny things that, uh, happen in the military. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and, uh, is that still on? We can turn it off. Can we turn it off? Or? Yeah.